Okay, now it's time actually. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for all of you for coming to the eighth software summer school on emergence of life. Uh, we have uh, already eight uh, lecturer in this summer school. Today we have ninth lecturer, Professor Lamin Golestein, uh, and uh, he got his uh, bachelor degree from Sharif University of Technology, Iran. And he did his PhD uh, from Institute for Advanced Study in Basic Science in Zhangjiang. His advisor was uh, Mehran Kadar and MIT. And after that, he went for postdoc, uh, Cavalry Institute at UCSB. After that, he served as a professor at University of Sheffield and Oxford University. Recently, he joined uh, MPI. He is now director of MPI for Dynamics and Self-Organization at, at Göttingen. Uh, he had a, a lot of interest in research field. His key interest recently was uh, active soft mirror, especially microscopic swimmers and active colloid. Recently, he did a lot of work on chemically active matter. So he will give a talk about chemically active matter. Let's welcome Ramin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... So um, I uh, will talk about uh, chemically active matter. Um, uh, essentially, uh, uh, first I will I will start with with the motivation, and the motivation is chemical activity, which is quite common in uh, in living systems. You know, every living system has metabolism, which involves uh, non-equilibrium chemical activity can be viewed, of course, as uh, something that provides a source of energy and uh, essentially a drive for the system to maintain its non-equilibrium activity. But we can also think about it as a route to self-organization. So something which can provide new interactions, new uh, ways for different components of the system to identify each other and form structures. And essentially, the purpose of this course will be to think about what kind of structures, uh, what kind of self-organization we can achieve using this kind of non-equilibrium activity and whether uh, we can learn any interesting physics from that. Uh, I will focus uh, uh, first on interfacial phoretic transport phenomenon and uh, basically uh, talk about uh, some of the microscopic uh, mechanisms behind that and what it means for different colloidal particles at different scales, for example, enzymes at the small scale, where they are the source of chemical activity themselves, uh, and uh, all the way to larger scale structures, uh, even uh, whole organisms that respond to chemical gradients, the, the so-called phenomenon of chemotaxis. Um, I highlight non-reciprocal interactions. This is something which very naturally emerges in uh, active matter with chemical activity, but also uh, with other kinds of activity, for example, short range uh, local interaction. Non-reciprocal interaction is simply uh, what A inflicts on B or what B experiences from A is different from uh, the other way around. Uh, so interaction between two uh, objects is not simply defined by a potential uh, or, or an action-reaction uh, uh, rule. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, cooperativity and cooperative effects uh, in enzyme suspensions in particular, and then uh, uh, towards the end, uh, uh, build a multi-scale study of chemotaxis, which starts from some microscopic models and then goes through a process of coarse graining, uh, which is basically, uh, I think, very good uh, kind of exercise for this school, uh, and then build a uh, macro scale theory at the level of the uh, sort of large scale in the system where you can study collective behavior and you can make the connection between the different scales. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, what enzymes do. Um, essentially, uh, you can think about uh, the role of enzymes as uh, playing or uh, 
uh, fine-tuning uh, uh, energy landscape that is behind the uh, in the so-called reaction coordinate uh, uh, system behind the transition uh, of uh, chemical reactions. So uh, they typically deal with reactions that happen anyway, uh, but because of the existence of a barrier, of a large energy barrier, they will happen uh, via energy um, sort of thermal activation over an exponentially long time. And uh, what the enzyme does is essentially um, uh, if S uh, substrate wants to be converted to P product, uh, the enzyme binds to it and then essentially uh, modifies, um, I don't know, by changing the bond length and, and orientations and things like that, complicated uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, uh, then the, uh, the resulting transition uh, is going to be easier because the barrier is effectively lower. Uh, the kinetics of this, so the rate of production of P molecule uh, can be calculated if you basically assign a two-step process for the binding on binding uh, with an active site, which can be either empty or, or, um, uh, or uh, filled or, or in the form of a complex, and then couple that to the uh, chemical, which will come along uh, and uh, essentially look at this reaction in stationary state. You can calculate the overall rate, and that would be proportional to this K cat, which is the non equilibrium step in this reaction, the concentration of enzymes, E naught, and then the so called Michaelis Menten rule, um, a concentration of the substrate, uh, which appears in this combination. So when uh, you are at the low concentrations of the substrate, essentially, the rate is linear in the concentration, and they call that regime diffusion limited. And when uh, there's a lot of substrate, uh, there's saturation, and essentially they call that regime reaction limited. So the, depending on what the bottleneck of the reaction is, you can have different regime. So uh, bottom line is that enzymes are drivers of non-equilibrium activity of the chemical form at the right time at the right place. So when you need something to happen quickly, an enzyme uh, being there can achieve that. And that's a very interesting concept. Now, uh, with this definition, we want to ask what happens when you have many of these um, and they interact uh, because of their chemical activity, how do they organize in space and time? Essentially, what kind of structures can they form? Uh, so typically, when we think of metabolism, we have networks of these enzymes. So something like this one, um, very, very complicated uh, connectivity uh, pattern. And essentially, uh, the question is, given that these enzymes connect to each other in this very complex way, uh, is there any uh, physical rule that we can learn from these non-equilibrium interactions? that will basically suggest maybe some structure formation, which will facilitate this kind of uh, interaction, uh, basically, in the networks. Uh, and ultimately, the goal is to look at a living cell and basically try to understand uh, structure formation. For example, uh, if you look at the structure of a eukaryotic cell, you can see that uh, all the information is stored in one place. Uh, the materials factory where the proteins are synthesized are more or less localized in the, in the vicinity. Energy is provided essentially in mitochondrion, which is the energy factory. So again, spatial uh, uh, organization there. There is mechanical structure. There is a scaffold. Uh, both providing tracks for transport and also for structure and uh, overall sort of shape. Um, and, and all of this essentially is in the end uh, made of basic units, uh, proteins and, uh, and so on. And, and these interact uh, in this non-equilibrium environment. So we want to see how much of this uh, structure formation we can uh, explain or, or put another way, if we think about the origin of life, uh, we want to basically ask a very, very specific physical question, uh, which is suppose we take a living cell, we uh, 
we collect all the chemicals that we, we know that living cell has, and we put them in a sack uh, of the same type that the cell has, then how do we go from this, let's say, random initial condition, which we provide a uh, sack of chemicals to this highly structured, um, highly organized and uh, basically uh, living uh, uh, version of the same uh, uh, composition. And this was essentially the question that Schrodinger put forward in, in his book. Okay, um, so uh, there are many things that we can we can look at. Uh, I would like to essentially uh, propose a shortcut, and uh, uh, in this shortcut, we basically uh, abstract some of the things that have been observed at the small scale uh, in in dynamics of enzymes, uh, without going too much into the mechanistic. Uh, um, implications or, or reasons that these things are observed. Uh, basically, and ask the question, what happens when we have, uh, or if we have these uh, mechanisms? Uh, uh, so what happens if uh, diffusion of enzymes depends on the concentration of the chemical that they act on, uh, uh, so-called enhanced diffusion, which is uh, reported by many experimental groups uh, when enzymes are catalytically active. Uh, and what happens when uh, they respond to the gradients of the substrate also uh, essentially going towards the higher concentration or away from the uh, uh, higher concentration. Uh, by putting together these ingredients, we will basically be able to study the, the self-organization that comes from it. And uh, you know, I think this question in itself uh, is, can be studied independently of why those things happen and to what extent essentially those things uh, can be explained. Um, and, you know, whether um, all the experiments show the same thing and so on, which are some of the lively discussions that are going on these days in these communities. Um, by the way, if you have any questions or, or comments uh, you want to discuss, this is meant to be a course, so I think it, it's uh, better if it is interactive. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, responding to the gradient, uh, there are at least two ways that an enzyme can respond to a gradient of its own substrate. One is uh, Phoresis, so diffusiophoresis, uh, which is basically uh, a very natural response because uh, an enzyme must uh, have some kind of attractive interaction with the substrate so that the binding can occur. And because of that, uh, uh, quite naturally, you can calculate the uh, phoretic mobility and, and estimate uh, the mobility of, of the colloid, the velocity that it will have uh, in the presence of the gradient of that substrate concentration. Uh, it's a, a function of a length scale, um, which basically um, knows about the second virial of that interaction that I was, I was talking about. Uh, also, if uh, for any reason uh, there is enhanced diffusion or modified diffusion, uh, uh, in the presence of the substrate, uh, the gradient of that naturally uh, enters um, this kind of drift. This is a calculation uh, that essentially falls in the category of the very complex uh, multiplicative noise uh, uh, phenomena. So you have to do it very carefully and you have to start from a starting point where you basically know um, exactly what you're dealing with. Um, and the result of that, uh, which is similar to what we have in the um, active colloids uh, literature also, is that uh, the net drift will tend to be away from the place where the concentration of the, where the diffusion coefficient of the enzyme is higher, and that is concentration dependent. Uh, and as a result of that, there's a competition between the phoretic uh, tendency and the one coming from simply enhanced diffusion. 
And this in itself can be a, a very powerful uh, tool for self-organization because you can see they can compete in a way that depends on the consecration. So that would basically be able to uh, separate them and create structure, just as an example. Okay, um, so uh, in general, these transport phenomena uh, uh, such as electrophoresis, diffusiophoresis, thermophoresis, and so on, uh, are non-equilibrium um, uh, interfacial uh, transport uh, processes. Uh, they are force-free, uh, and uh, essentially they uh, typically happen when um, a thermodynamic potential is somehow uh, made to have a gradient and that gradient is maintained externally uh, somehow. And then the interaction between the colloidal surface and uh, the ingredients that form that thermodynamic potential, for example, uh, electrostatic potential for electrophoresis, uh, chemical potential for diffusiophoresis, uh, thermal energy for thermophoresis and so on. Uh, will essentially lead to a uh, so-called relative slip velocity between the uh, surface of the colloid and the uh, fluid beyond the layer where these uh, uh, interactions or the sort of internal structure of the interfacial region can be resolved. Um, let's talk about uh, the details of this mechanism because it's quite subtle and I think it would be useful uh, in a school like this to, to go through the steps. Uh, I will basically discuss all the equations. And again, I would like to ask um, the participants to uh, you know, uh, interact and, and ask questions and so on if they uh, would like to, uh, to discuss this calculation. OK, so. Um, Let's focus on diffusiophoresis. We have a uh, medium which is basically made of an incompressible solvent, uh, viscous fluid. We have a solution of uh, some chemicals uh, inside that, and we have a colloid. Uh, and we are zooming in basically very close to the surface of the colloid. So this big uh, gray bar is the uh, surface of the interface of the colloid. And we are looking at the interaction between the colloid and the solutes in the medium, which is basically the incompressible viscous uh, solvent. For the solute molecules, we have to write the continuity equation. So time derivative of the concentration plus divergence of the flux is zero. And the flux comes from the diffusive term in which we basically put in uh, Stokes-Einstein uh, uh, equation, so for the mobility and, and thermal energy. Um, there is a drift term, uh, which basically comes from uh, the interaction between solid molecules and the surface. So this W is the potential, think of Leonard Jones or something like that, a very short range um, interaction potential. Uh, and then uh, you can also have uh, drift due to the solvent velocity. Um, on the other hand, for the solvent itself, you have an incompressible fluid. Uh, so you can write a Stokes equation, that's Navier-Stokes, where you get rid of the nonlinearity, uh, uh, the inertial uh, advection nonlinearity, and also the time derivative, because the processes are happening at sufficiently slow pace. Uh, there is a pressure term, and this body term, uh, which is essentially the volume density of the force that is exerted at any given point. Uh, that force um, will basically be uh, the concentration of the solute times this force minus grad W, which we talked about earlier. So the same force that we use in the uh, continuity equation for the chemicals uh, now is essentially passed on to the uh, solvent as well. And then we have the incompressibility condition divergence of V equals zero. So we can implement this uh, incompressibility condition on the Stokes equation and essentially obtain an equation for pressure, which is now a Lagrange multiplier to ensure that incompressibility is satisfied. 
Uh, that equation will be Laplacian of P is basically given by divergence of F. Uh, and then we need to couple that to the stationary state equation of the continuity, which is essentially divergence of C is also divergence of F uh, if we essentially uh, ignore this advection term. Um, and this is very interesting. So if you think about it, um, F, this uh, force density, which comes from uh, the basically very short range, very singular interaction between the solid molecule and the surface is a very singular object, mathematically speaking, because uh, it, it has a, a range, which is a few angstroms. Uh, and in that range, it's you know like a 612 potential, so very, very sharp. Uh, very, very abrupt behavior. And then we're calculating the divergence of that. Uh, so this object divergence of F is a very singular object which lives uh, very close to the surface, a few angstroms away, and then it's zero uh, beyond that. And in order to resolve that, uh, basically the best way to uh, go forward is to find a way to get rid of this term. So. Uh, combine these two equations, one for the concentration and one for the pressure, such that essentially there is no uh, singularity in the equation. So if you subtract them off, uh, you basically find out that uh, this combination P minus KBT times C, uh, which looks like hydrostatic uh, and osmotic pressure uh, due to the presence of the solute uh, combined together, uh, somehow satisfies a Laplace equation if you act, um, essentially ignore this advection uh, term. If we are at sufficiently low Peclet numbers, we can do that and get rid of this term. And then we obtain essentially Laplacian of P minus KBTC is zero, which means this combination is a smooth function when you are approaching the surface. Uh, while Individually, both P and C will have singularities in them because of the uh, divergence of F term that I mentioned. So uh, now that we understand this mathematical structure better, essentially it means that in that uh, very thin layer, we are talking about a few angstroms, um, we can approximate this combination P minus KBT times C uh, as a constant uh, or a slow varying function. Uh, and that is interesting because if you look at what we expect of this combination, uh, in fact, uh, the expectation uh, is also very singular because out there in the bulk, we know that pressure is constant because we don't want to study pressure uh, uh, you know, flow due to external pressure gradients. We want to study basically um, uh, flow, which is uh, only due to um, gradients in the concentration. So, uh, Ramesh, uh, yes, uh, audience suggests you use the laser point. Okay, Can you do that. Um, they have a difficulty following. Okay, okay, yes. I, in fact, I wasn't using my pointer that much, but let me uh, let me try. Uh, or maybe using the cursor. Uh, using what? Sorry. Using the cursor, your pointer in the computer. Yes, the, uh, the pointer I can use because when I'm when I'm changing, I think it would be easier to uh, use the laser pointer, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, now see. we can see your cursor coming in. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so the cursor is easier. Let me let me try okay. and use that. Okay. Yeah. So um, if you um, so going back to this argument, if you don't want to have external gradient in the in the bulk um, and you want to have a gradient in the concentration, uh, basically we will have an outer layer where uh, there is a gradient on C, but no gradient on P. Uh, then if you look at what happens exactly on the surface, which is basically deep inside this layer, uh, 
because of this interaction, for example, because of the repulsive part of this interaction, uh, which enforces excluded volume, you know that the concentration of the solute will be zero on the surface. Um, and that means there is no gradient on the concentration. Um, and because of that, all the gradients which must exist on this combination, because it's a, it's a smooth function, will be taken over by the pressure. So, so essentially, we have a layer which is very thin, a few angstroms uh, only, um, in which there is gradient of hydrostatic pressure because C somehow is different in there compared to the one which is out there in the bulk. And, and in that layer, because of the gradient um, on the hydrostatic pressure, we start, start to have a fluid motion. Um, and this layer is called the fluid slip uh, layer. And the thickness of that is basically determined by the interaction uh, range, uh, which, is, which is essentially very, very thick. Uh, so then if we combine these um, uh, ingredients, essentially, uh, we can think about uh, uh, having gradients that are generated locally. So uh, there is no reason, uh, because as I said, these mechanisms are force free, um, for this gradient to be generated externally. You can have chemical activity, which is basically uh, controlled by fluxes of particles, uh, essentially representing chemical reactions and so on, uh, lead to formation of gradients and then uh, there will be this effective mobility, which is, uh, suppose you have a gradient near a surface, what would be the effective uh, fluid velocity, uh, which we would call the slip velocity um, in this language. So these two parameters, alpha and mu, will be basically uh, uh, the, the right uh, ingredients to study these uh, non-equilibrium phenomena. Um, and I would refer you to this uh, archive uh, preprint, which is basically uh, lecture notes on uh, sporetic active matter uh, for basically more details on this microscopic derivation, uh, if you're interested in that, plus, uh, plus other things that will come out of it. Okay, so how do we go about uh, uh, studying uh, these phenomena? Essentially, uh, we will need to couple um, uh, the fluid uh, flow uh, locally near the boundary uh, surface to the gradients of the concentration. So we have a, a boundary condition that connects the slip velocity to the gradient, tangential gradient uh, of the concentration using this mobility. And the mobility can be a local function on the surface. For example, if you take your surface and coat it with different types of material, um, you would have different uh, uh, values for the mobility. That's the range of the interaction and so on. Uh, then to calculate the gradient of concentration, you would basically need to solve reaction diffusion equation in the bulk with the boundary condition that on the surface, you have certain fluxes uh, controlled by this activity parameter. Again, that could be local. Uh, you can even think about dealing with an enzyme which has a binding pocket and things like that. So essentially you can characterize very, very locally uh, the fluxes that are generated due to the reaction. And then coupling the two together, you can calculate um, everything you want to know about that system. Um, and in particular, we can make uh, self-propelled particles. For example, uh, uh, this Janus particle uh, construction is based on this uh, the physics, essentially you uh, coat uh, a colloid asymmetrically with a catalyst and then you put it in a solution um, with the molecules that the catalyst would break down, but provided with a uniform concentration. And then the catalyst will break down the, the molecules and create effectively a gradient. So there are more products on the right um, compared to the left, and there are basically less uh, substrate molecules or, or fuel molecules. So there are two types of gradients and combination of these effects will uh, lead to propulsion in some uh, direction. For example, if the interactions are primarily repulsive, uh, there's twice as many more ingredients on this side as on that side, and that leads to effectively propulsion away from the catalytic patch. Uh, 
and in the experiment you can basically make this kind of uh, construction um, again uh, studying mechanistically the details uh, uh, will basically uh, uh, need uh, uh, a, a little bit of patience for example uh, it could be that you have different kinds of phoretic mechanisms involved uh, in the same system and uh, sometimes they even compete and so on so you can change uh, things like directionality and so on by uh, essentially controlling uh, parameters or external parameters. Hi, so can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so I think in the, before going to the genus particles, you have two, like essentially two parameters, mobility and activity. And mm -hmm. what are the two, um, two parameters in this um, genus particle? Because I thought the velocity is seems to be the only parameter that tells you how. Yes. Not to open this but system. the velocity is a function of activity and mobility. Okay. It's proportional to both of them. I see. Yes. I see. Yeah. Okay. And, and but it, uh, yes, and you have to have some kind of asymmetry uh, uh, for this to work. I think I don't have the details here, but. I refer you to this uh, lecture note. You can you can yeah. read more about it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, and and uh, one thing which is interesting about uh, this experiment is you can read the velocity essentially by analyzing the mean square displacement as a function of the, the concentration of the fuel and uh, observe that the velocity essentially follows the rate of reaction of the uh, uh, of the substrate or, or the fuel in a way that looks like michaelis menten rule. So that means you have a window uh, into the kinetics of the catalytic reaction by simply doing particle tracking on the, uh, on the swimmer itself. Okay, um, now uh, let's uh, see what happens when we put uh, two of these active colloidal particles together. They could be enzymes or, or colloidal uh, uh, particles. In particular, I want to use uh, fully symmetric ones that will not self-propel themselves individually because I'm interested in studying uh, uh, routes to self-organization. So what happens when they don't uh, move themselves, but together they can essentially um, uh, have a mechanism which uh, which creates motion. So if you if you think about um, the, the gradient of a concentration which is generated by a by a spherical source or spherically symmetric source, essentially you are dealing with chemical fields that are uh, uh, radially symmetric and they decay as one over R. They are proportional to the rate of catalytic activity alpha inversely proportional to the diffusion coefficient of the chemical and so on. Um, and then the drift velocity comes from the gradient of this. So in a way, it looks like Coulomb or gravitational potential. So you have essentially a potential um, C, which is generated by a charge or a mass, uh, which is alpha. Uh, and then the gradient of that will essentially create a drift or a velocity which will act on another particle. But immediately from this equation, you now see that interaction between two colloids is going to be uh, uh, sort of uh, generally speaking, quite non-trivial because uh, if you have two colloids that are different, they have different catalytic activities and different mobilities. So this one, number one has alpha one and mu one. This one, number two has alpha two and mu two. Uh, the velocity of colloid number one will be proportional to gradient of one over R, um, and the velocity of colloid number two will also be proportional to the gradient of one over R. So they are similar to action and reaction, uh, but the charge or mass that is generating the uh, potential for one of them uh, is different to the charge and mass that is responding to the potential that is generated by the other one. Uh, here, the generating charge or mass is alpha two, the alpha of particle number two, 
and the uh, charge or mass that responds to the field is mu one, the mu of particle number one. And vice versa for this one is alpha one and mu two. And in general, unless we do some fine tuning uh, in the synthesis, in fact, alpha two times mu one uh, has no reason to be equal to alpha one times mu two. So uh, that means in these non-equilibrium systems, we basically generically don't have action-reaction symmetry. We don't have uh, interaction potentials. Uh, essentially, the interaction uh, that is experienced by one is different from the interaction that is experienced by two. And this will have interesting consequences, uh, as we will see. For example, let's think about mixtures of these particles when they behave almost like ionic liquids, so with uh, uh, alpha valences that are different in sign um, and valence, so that you would expect to, to form some kind of ionic molecules. Uh, but if you frustrate the system such that there is no obvious way to neutralize, um, you know, because you don't know which one to take, uh, uh, whether to take the alpha valences to neutralize or the new ones, um, then you will form uh, different kinds of molecules in the same construction. This is a Brownian dynamic simulation, and you can see that uh, pairs, A, B molecules uh, out of A, 1A and 1B, and also A, B, 2 molecules, 1A and 2B, uh, uh, colloids uh, can form, and when they form, they are uh, asymmetric, exactly like a Janus particle. They have exactly the same structure, and that means they can self-propel, uh, but also they are made of parts that can be exchanged. So uh, they are not rigid Janus particles. Uh, they are flexible Janus particles that form via self-organization, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, Hi, so they, is there a chance that those uh, self-propelled particle can interact, like um, have an alignment, like getting a Vivtech model type, like effectively? Uh, so you can, inter you can study their interaction. Um, I have a slide on uh, 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 polar particles. So these are not polar particles um, and uh, they become polar when they are formed, so they right. essentially uh, they acquire this polarity. But you can actually start from Janus particles that are intrinsic. Sure, sure, sure. I was asking if those the the, the these non reciprocally interacting system that and then they form um, self like uh, spontaneously form these um, Vicek type particles. Do they um, have alignment interaction too, or? Uh, so they will have alignment interaction, and the alignment interaction is uh, non-reciprocal uh, if they are not the same. So if they are the same, uh, then the alignment interaction, uh, I mean, I, I have a slide on that, so I'll, I'll cool. show you. Uh, but for now, we are essentially looking at positional interactions, uh, which is, uh, in fact, um, uh, a lot easier than, than alignment uh, interactions, I think. And historically, this is, uh, you know, the first uh, thing that came out uh, with the non-reciprocal uh, interaction. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you can study these uh, structures um, and basically, you know, like any uh, uh, question about formation of molecules or or complexes, uh, you can study their uh, shape and uh, assign symmetry uh, properties to their shape. Uh, and based on the symmetry that they have, you can assign a function. Uh, for example, the ones on the top row all have axial symmetry, which means they will have uh, a, a, a sort of substantial uh, translational propulsion component. Um, the ones in the on the second row, they basically have uh, something like an intrinsic spin uh, and no uh, translational uh, propulsion. And on the third row, they are too symmetric to have any kind of mechanical activity, but they are still chemically uh, active. Uh, and this is basically, it, it's interesting if you think about it this way, 
you are uh, discussing the 3D structure that can be designed. Essentially, you, you design these uh, active monomers, you throw them in the solution, they form these complexes spontaneously, and based on the uh, shape that they acquire, they can have a unique function, a unique non-equilibrium function. And that's uh, very similar to the paradigm that the proteins have. Uh, essentially, they also uh, have uh, design sequences that form 3D unique structures that will have a unique function because of that shape. Um, and that suggests that maybe this route to self-organization can be used uh, for more complicated um, uh, tasks, basically, for uh, designing things that will um, self-organize and perform uh, tasks. Uh, one of the ways that you can make this more exciting is to have uh, structures that uh, are dynamic. For example, in this particular uh, simulation, uh, we had two different isomers uh, essentially in coexistence. Uh, so the one that is like a T uh, has axial symmetry, which means uh, but uh, no reflection symmetry um, in the sort of back to front. Uh, uh, axis, which means it has self-propulsion, whereas the one that looks like a Y is simply too symmetric to have self-propulsion. And there is a barrier between them, which can be thermally activated. So it, then you would have a situation where you go uh, between, es essentially, uh, you can switch between these two configurations and acquire a run and tumble uh, type, um, uh, basically, transition for an object which is entirely self-organized. So this is uh, also, uh, if you think about it, uh, it's made of degrees of freedom that are continuous. So it's a very interesting uh, way to, um, to reduce the space of possibilities. Uh, you can have uh, spontaneous oscillation. For example, this molecule, which is quite big when it forms uh, and you're seeing basically the uh, time evolution of it, it will start to, to beat um, at a given frequency. Um, but because it's essentially uh, too symmetric, it will not have a self-propulsion. Because you're seeing the time evolution, essentially, uh, a lot of the intermediate steps are also uh, observed, and you can see how uh, shape asymmetry essentially correlates with speed when they when they travel. This object is starting to form from one end, and then as it goes basically to the to the middle, it, it picks up speed, and then as it builds the second half, it slows down, and finally, when it acquires the last blue. Uh, monomer essentially becomes fully symmetric, which means it will no longer uh, travel in one direction, but, but it is unstable. Um, you can start from this structure and deform it and do a linear stability analysis and obtain uh, the eigenvalues of the, of the dynamical motion and, and see that it becomes imaginary at some point. Uh, so as I said um, earlier, we can essentially now um, make parallels between uh, some of the structures that are obtained. For example, something like a sperm is a self-organized uh, protofilament, which basically has a bifurcation um, uh, into a, a beating pattern that couples to the fluid and gives you self-propulsion, plus a container which has uh, some cargo to be delivered. And uh, we can basically uh, essentially use the same kind of uh, design principle to, to make something like that in a completely self-organized way. So random initial condition, uh, colloids chemically active, interacting with each other phoretically, they will form these uh, asymmetric structures, which will have this kind of bifurcation. Uh, uh, for a beating instability and the back to front asymmetry, which will allow it to swim uh, also. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, now um, let's see how we can uh, do some calculation. And in particular, I will focus a little bit on uh, near field effects because uh, in some of these uh, structures, you, you see that the particles get very close to one another and it, um, it makes sense to, to ask the questions, what happens to these interactions when they are relatively close to, to one another? Um, so the framework we are using uh, is essentially uh, basically as before, uh, Stokes hydrodynamics and uh, chemical reaction diffusion without advection, zero per clay number. Um, and we know that for um, spherically symmetric particles, there is no uh, propulsion. When we have two of them, we can couple um, uh, the chemical interaction and the hydrodynamic interaction via diffusion and Stokes equation uh, uh, through the slip velocities that connect basically gradients generated by these uh, activities uh, via the uh, mobility coefficients. Uh, if you want to solve this problem exactly, so for two spheres at any distance, you basically need to solve these two equations. So uh, Laplace equation with the boundary condition that you have the normal fluxes on both surfaces, um, essentially controlled by these um, activity uh, coefficients. And then Stokes equation with incompressibility condition with the boundary condition that essentially uh, you have particles that are moving and slip velocities that are essentially determined by the gradients of the concentration. Uh, and in the far field, uh, we saw that earlier already that we will have uh, these simple uh, gradient forms. Uh, but that means essentially there's only uh, two possibilities for the interaction between them. Because when um, the, this combination alpha 2 uh, mu 1 plus alpha 1 mu 2 is attractive, uh, essentially uh, the two colloids will be attracted to one another. And when this combination is positive, uh, they will repel each other. So essentially, we have two regimes uh, independently of the initial condition of the distance between the particles. Um, it turns out that we can solve this problem exactly for two spheres. Uh, more than two is complicated uh, for you know, all uh, distances and conditions and so on, but for two, it's possible um, using bispherical coordinates. Um, and uh, it's easier to use Lorentz's reciprocal theorem uh, to solve uh, the, the problem because basically we are interested in velocities uh, of the colloids. Um, and it's easier to just go for that problem essentially by uh, using two auxiliary problems, um, which is two particles moving with the same velocity with force in one direction or moving with the same velocity towards each other, um, uh, essentially. Uh, and we can construct uh, these exact solutions, um, uh, essentially, uh, we know that from the linearity of the boundary conditions and, uh, and of the reaction rates uh, or, or the equations and the reaction rates, we can write generic solutions uh, proportional to the, the two alphas and some reflection symmetry. And then the velocities will, will reflect that by uh, having products of, of the mobilities and the activities, uh, the same ones uh, on the same colloid and the opposite ones uh, for the far field part or the uh, location of the other colloid. Uh, and then by solving these uh, through the Lorentz's reciprocal theorem, these auxiliary problems, we can calculate uh, these coefficients um, essentially that come from, uh, from those hydrodynamic problems uh, and essentially uh, evaluate these uh, averages of stress, uh, including the surface slip velocity on each of the colloids. Um, then we basically get an expression which we can plot. Um, and it turns out that uh, in, in addition to the two regimes that we had before, uh, we obtain two other regimes as well. So uh, there are four different behaviors. Um, 
the, these two regimes, the attractive one and the, the repulsive one, uh, they change in a quantitative way. So um, if you compare the far field uh, solution um, to the exact solution, in fact, the exact solution does a lot better, or I don't know, it's enhanced uh, or, or gets very uh, strong in comparison. But in this regime and also in that regime, the sense of interaction is not changed. Uh, but then there are other uh, two other regimes in which the sense of interaction is changed. For example, in this one, uh, the colloids are by far field solutions supposed to always attract each other. But uh, uh, it, if you add the near field effect, at some point they uh, start to see a repulsive interaction. Uh, I mean, a, a, a reduction in the attractive interaction and then uh, at some point uh, transition to a repulsive interaction and vice versa. And that means we have, in these two regimes, we can have fixed points that are stable and unstable. And this is a, a unique structure which you don't have in electrostatics. So no matter what you do uh, with this Coulomb analogy, you don't get to have a situation where two charges uh, stay at a finite distance and give you a, a stable fixed point, for example. But this non-equilibrium, uh, analog uh, can achieve that. So here you can see a few uh, videos, for example, comparison of the exact solution with what you expect from the far field uh, in regime three, which is where you have this stable fixed point at a finite distance. Um, and in regime four, this is, uh, this can give you two different possibilities. One is uh, a situation where essentially they are beyond the stable fixed point, so they go away. And another, uh, when they are within the, uh, I mean, before the barrier, let's say, and that means they collapse onto each other, uh, even though the far field solution predicts that they um, repel each other. So, and the, I mean, I have a one yes. question. Uh, it's not clear to me which uh, equation tell us about the, this uh, uh, velocity of a center of mass when these two particles merge together, they move much faster, right? Yes, that's correct. So, um, so where, where should I look at them? Where, where should I look yes. uh, get this uh, idea? So if you look at, um, if you look at these two equations in the far field, you have access to individual velocities uh, and basically when they are far from each other that tells you what happens to the individual colloids so one of them moves let's say this one moves to the right with some velocity that one moves to the left or even to the right with another velocity and at this point they are independent and they move with velocities which could even be in the same direction uh, in some cases, depending on the alphas and mu's. Okay. Then when they start touching, there is another uh, interaction between them because there will be a, a reciprocal one in addition that is simply via contact or some short range interaction, which you can add. The way we do the calculation is by using a constraint force. So we say if they are to maintain this particular radius, it means they have to have a force between them, which will maintain that. And then in the kinematic equations, you can add that as a constraint force, uh, which will translate into a velocity. And then you would still have access to individual velocities. But now that you have this constraint, uh, they go together. So both velocities will essentially move in the same direction. But uh, simply put, you have two velocities. You can subtract them and obtain this relative velocity and you can add them and obtain or, or average them and obtain an average uh, net center of mass velocity. And um, when we solve for the exact uh, problem, we focus on what happens to the average velocity, but we also, uh, so what happens to the relative velocity, but we also have information about the average velocity because it, it's from the same solution, basically. So in the yeah. videos, you see the full, uh, the full velocities, which means uh, essentially all of these effects are, are taken into account. But do you also consider in the far field for uh, pairwise correlation functions or not? 
so uh, pairwise correlation function, you mean? Um, the two particles are actually passing each other, and then how much is the pair correlation function? Uh, so, um, I mean, when, when they are in uh, contact, the pair correlation function tells us that there is a correlation hole. There is basically a radius of expulsion that we take into account. Uh, but for example, uh, I mean, uh, if you if you have in mind something which which is more about the suspension of many of these uh, by averaging essentially many many pairs. Um, that's not what we do here. We only solve for two uh, colloids uh, essentially interacting with each other as a function of distance. Mm -hmm. But that also depends on the Reynolds number, right? The relative ratio of this uh, um, the, uh, relative velocity, I guess. So Reynolds number is zero in these calculations. Uh, there is no inertia. Okay, um, okay I'll just keep continuing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, Changbang, did I answer your question? Well, I guess so, but I, I don't know. You, you only showed us some some relative. You you talked about some effect of constraint, but it's not entirely clear to me. But uh, in the slide, only you show only showing the um, I said relative velocity. Once these two particles merge together, stick together, relative velocity of these two two particles is a zero, right? Yes, that's correct. So as of that point, the relative velocity will be zero right. and there will be still a net velocity for both of them, which will basically always be the same. Uh, right. but, but, it's, but somehow it, it's, it's doubled because what I mean, the velocity get doubled, right? Or it's much faster when, when, when things merge together, the velocity seems to be much greater than the uh, when things are, are uh, not merged. They are followed. Yes, that, that is a function of, uh, I mean, if you think about it, the Coulomb interaction. Um, so, so this object uh, mm -hmm. is always uh, essentially going to increase when delta uh, goes to zero. Delta goes to the zero. maximum value for it when delta is zero. So when you we start from a large delta and they basically are attracted to each other, I this see. relative so velocity. V, v rel means, I mean, the, the center of mass velocity or relative velocity? Oh, no, this is the relative velocity. Right. But the center of mass velocity is the exact same expression mm -hmm. with this sign changed to minus, right? Oh, because I you see. have two velocities and okay. then you add them and you subtract them. Mm -hmm. So apart from this constant coefficient which sits there, the behavior of the relative velocity as a function of distance reflects the behavior of the net mean velocity as a function of distance. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I mean, if you want, I can show you the calculation using some other notes, but I, I don't know if that's... Um, if that's helpful or, or the right way to do it, or we can do this in the question part. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I can do it now. So let me stop sharing uh, and open. Do you see these handwritten notes now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. So this is essentially the same calculation. Um, and um, basically I have two particles. 
A and B, they are called here, and I calculate velocity of A, velocity of B using these, this gradient construction, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I add to that um, this external pot uh, internal potential, which is a function of the distance between them. Mm -hmm. um, and I call that an equilibrium uh, contribution. This is, for example, um, in the extreme case when it's contact interaction is only non-zero when they are in contact and it's zero when they are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that component has this VA equals minus VB because action and reaction is uh, the same or, or equal and opposite. Now I can go from RA and RB to the, the relative and center of mass coordinates and also calculate the relative velocity and the mean uh, velocity. Uh, and this part of it is exactly what I was talking about in the slides where essentially the uh, sign of this combination changes when you go from the relative velocity to the mean velocity, uh, but uh, the overall behavior as a function of distance and so on doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then the relative velocity also picks up this equilibrium component. Uh, which you can see here, the gradient of U, which is not present in the center of mass velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means, for example, you can calculate uh, equilibration for that uh, molecule if, if you don't force them to be together and there is thermal fluctuation. In fact, they will maintain um, some kind of average distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is, uh, from that and from the way this distance uh, determines the uh, center of mass velocity, you can actually calculate a velocity distribution uh, for the molecule, uh, which has this funny exponential um, and power law form. Uh, now, what I was telling you about uh, is, a, is a bit more clear in this calculation when uh, we want to see what happens when you have three colloids and can you determine the equilibrium stable structure of the of the colloid? So you can write down these, uh, uh, put them in contact, so where this constraint uh, force or velocity will be in place, and write down expressions for the velocity of colloid A of B1 and B2. There will be these non-equilibrium components proportional to mu and alpha and so on. And there will be these equilibrium ones by symmetry along these directions. So these are, for now, they are constrained um, forces or, or drift velocity. Mm -hmm. Then I determine the value of that by saying that I want the colloids to maintain this kind of distance. So uh, if, if, if I want there to be no penetration between A and B, that means the relative velocity uh, dotted with this uh, uh, vector which connects the centers has to be zero. And this way I can read off my constraint force or constraint velocity, uh, which is a function of the configuration. And then I put that back into the equation, then I can essentially derive an effective equation for the angle phi, which uh, I can solve for this molecule. And it turns out that um, under some conditions, there's a stable fixed point, which means the molecule will have this shape. And under other conditions, the stable fixed point is at phi equals zero, which means a linear molecule is stable um, and so on. So this is essentially uh, the, the, the simple way you can incorporate near field effects via this equilibrium uh, uh, component. Let me see. Okay. Yep, yes, thanks. Yeah, we can talk about this more if you want uh, later in the, in the question part. Okay, so um, let me go back to ah. Okay, um, so then the exact solution gives us 
four regimes, and in particular, these two uh, new regimes. And we basically saw these videos uh, uh, that tell us about the differences. Um, we can also try and understand uh, what is exactly happening. Why, why do we have this kind of um, behavior when we add the near field effects? So if you think about it, um, uh, the relative, the construction for the relative velocity, which uses the far field, um, essentially has the products alpha two mu one and alpha one mu two. Uh, you can think about it as in the language of reflections when you're solving differential equation as particle number one, only seeing the gradient generated by particle number two and vice versa. And in, in uh, practice for the exact solution, you can also have a situation where uh, every particle will feel the effect of its own uh, gradient, essentially as reflected uh, from the other boundary. So you can, uh, in principle, use the uh, linearity of the equations and add terms proportional to mu1 and alpha1 and mu2 and alpha2 uh, with a delta dependent factor, because this is essentially a reflection um, uh, of the uh, gradient generated by one particle from the surface of the other one. Uh, and it, it turns out that uh, you can, in fact, uh, use this approximation to uh, kill the hydrodynamic interaction and only use near field uh, effects in the chemical field uh, and provide a relatively good approximation of this effect. So. Um, if you want, uh, it's a lot easier to only deal with the chemical field in practice, for example, when you're doing a big simulation. Um, and this way we have justification that this is um, qualitatively going to give us the right uh, kind of effect. Uh, so this is basically pictorially what I was talking about. The, the first term, which is uh, the far field effect, it's equivalent to saying I kill the activity of this one and uh, the mobility of that one, and only look at this combination next to the opposite of that. And when I add the near field effect, I kill the activity and mobility of uh, the second colloid and look at the activity and mobility of one plus the reflection and vice versa. Um, and we can use the same thing to study what happens to a Janus particle near a surface. Uh, that also will have interesting uh, reflection effects that come from the same kind of physics. Um, and you can see here that the topology of the phase diagram uh, in the space of alpha and mu uh, is essentially the same when you have the full solution in comparison with when the chemical uh, field is exact, but there is no hydrodynamic interaction, which is uh, basically suggesting that there's a good approximation. Uh, okay, uh, we can study some of the properties of these fixed points. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we can study the location of the, of the fixed point uh, in this regime uh, as we go essentially from a situation where they are in contact, so we are in the attractive regime, to the regime where uh, they go way to infinity, uh, you expect the location of this fixed point to go from zero to infinity as you basically cross this uh, uh, boundary on the attractive side or on the repulsive side. Um, uh, and this exactly happens to the, to the solution when you do that. Uh, for the case where uh, we are in the regime four and uh, the particles are in a bound state and there's a barrier. You can calculate the first passage time because basically the right thermal activation can send the particle across the barrier and dissociate an already formed uh, complex or molecule. And you can study how that depends on the uh, ratio between the mobilities, for example. And uh, also on the other hand, the collapse time when you are uh, in regime one and you want to uh, see what is the relative uh, time uh, of collapse when they start from a, a distance uh, when you have the far field solution compared to when you have the exact solution, basically. 
Okay, so I think uh, 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 these discussions were mostly focused uh, on uh, two colloids, um, so non-reciprocal interaction uh, between two colloids, uh, and, and already we see that we get a lot of interesting phenomenology. Um, and then we want to, uh, uh, for example, when we go to the near field effect. Uh, then uh, we can also extend that uh, uh, and uh, study non-reciprocal alignment, as we were discussing earlier. Uh, when we have uh, two Janus particles, uh, basically the interaction uh, is uh, uh, non-reciprocal uh, uh, in the sense that it depends on the alignment, uh, depends on the orientation. So for the same reason that the chemical field uh, will basically exert uh, drift velocities, uh, the, the gradients will also exert alignment interaction, and then uh, they can have situations where, uh, for example, they, so it's a very complex phase diagram. You can read this paper from two years ago. Uh, they can make an orbit uh, which is stable. They can have um, this kind of uh, scattering event uh, where they basically stay repulsive and scatter off one another. You can have a situation where they come close and uh, have an attractive interaction and then eventually scatter off one another. Uh, or you can have a situation when they sort of move together uh, uh, as if they are essentially correlated uh, orientationally and, and scatter off that way. So all, all kinds of different possibilities. Um, and uh, basically you can, um, uh, you can look at the details if you want uh, in this paper. Now, uh, going from two to... Um, more than two um, is uh, essentially uh, going to bring in um, additional uh, complications or, or potential for interesting behavior. Uh, for example, uh, when you have mixtures, uh, uh, suspensions of different types of these colloids, you want to, to know uh, what happens to to the stability of these uh, Suspensions. Um, uh, by the way, uh, do I um, need to take a break? I mean, how do you usually do? Uh, uh, we go straight to the end of the time, or do you recommend that there's a gap between? Uh, typically, we go until the end of your talk. Okay. Uh, because this is a two hour talk, so including the question session. But if you want, you can have, take a break. No, no, no. Actually, I think I'm running a little bit behind, so I'd rather. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd rather go uh, uh, go forward. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, so with regards to thanks very much. Uh, with regards to mixtures, essentially, uh, imagine that we have different species, so m different species, uh, with different mobilities and different activities. Um, the same convention as before, so the mobilities are positive if they are repelled uh, from the solute and negative if they are attracted to it, and the activity is positive if it emits the solute and negative if it consumes the solute. And basically, we use the same solute uh, that is shared by all of these enzymes or colloids uh, uh, for simplicity, and we want to see whether this uh, system is stable or not. Um, you can write down continuity equation for these uh, different species. So for the uh, concentrations, uh, uh, rho i for the i species, you will have um, a time derivative of the uh, concentration plus divergence of the flux equals zero. And the flux is made of the diffusive part and the uh, phoretic drift part. And then the concentration of the chemical uh, essentially satisfies diffusion equation with the uh, colloids or enzymes being the source and sinks of the uh, chemical field, so they uh, appear on the right hand side with these coefficients alpha i um, essentially. Then we can do a linear stability analysis by expanding a, a, around a uniform concentration and then uh, uh, going to the uh, 
regime where the diffusion of the chemical happens more quickly than the diffusion of the colloids because there is a separation of length scale between them, um, then essentially we can uh, focus uh, uh, the equations at the linear level only on the uh, M species and write down a matrix of equations uh, in Fourier space, essentially, it will be an M by M eigenvalue problem. Uh, and then it turns out that uh, M minus one of those eigenvalues are diffusive, um, um, if they are all the same. Um, and there is one eigenvalue which can become positive and develop an instability. And if that happens, essentially, it will be an instability at the smallest uh, possible Q, so at the large scale. Uh, for the instability to happen, this combination, um, uh, the product of alphas and mu's and the densities has to be negative. And that means the modes uh, with Q value less than this combination uh, will be unstable. And that uh, implies macroscopic phase separation, essentially at the largest possible length. Uh, but what is interesting also about this uh, uh, calculation is that we have access to the eigenvectors of the uh, instability problem as well. Uh, so the eigenvector in the space of uh, uh, densities will tell us essentially the stoichiometry of the unstable uh, clusters, if you want. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, the ratio between uh, delta rho one, delta rho two, and so on, will be determined by these uh, factors, uh, which essentially means that we know uh, the composition of the unstable uh, modes in terms of you know what fraction of it comes from uh, species one and two and so on. Excuse me. Uh, so you, I think you said that there's only one mode that can become unstable, and does that mean that? The face of the way that phase separation happens is like once I mean they separate between the species. I mean, I just want to get some more like intuitive. Picture. Yes, I'll 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 show I'll show some examples uh, with the binary mixture because that's uh, uh, easier to see. So um, if you have two uh, species, essentially the combination uh, that needs to be satisfied is this for the instability. And the stoichiometry rule is delta rho 2 equals this ratio times delta rho 1. Um, and that means, uh, depending on the signs of mu's and alphas and so on, we could have different situations. For example, if the mobilities have the same sign, we will have aggregation of the two species in the unstable mode because the ratio between delta rho one and delta rho two is positive, which means if one species grows, uh, the other one grows with it in the unstable cluster. On the other hand, it's possible to maintain the same condition um, of instability and have a situation where the mu's have opposite sign. And in that case, they will separate from one another, which means if mu one, if rho one is growing, rho two is expelled from that uh, unstable cluster. To see a little bit more clearly this, uh, the different uh, possibilities, let's focus uh, on the different classes. Uh, first, when we have one producer and one consumer, so alpha one positive and alpha two negative. And we will have the same when the signs are the opposite. And then we look at the other class, which is two producers or two consumers at the same time. Uh, so for the case where we have one producer and one consumer, this is the full uh, phase diagram, uh, which has very interesting uh, structure. So first of all, I should tell you what I have on the axes. Um, I have essentially mu1 and mu2 on the two axes. Uh, but normalized or weighted by the densities and the absolute value of the activity. And because the activities have chosen signs, so alpha one is positive and alpha two is negative, that means I know the sense of interactions in these four different corners of the phase diagram. Um, the easiest one is this one, the bottom right, where essentially I have something equivalent to electrostatics. Uh, because species one repels itself and two repels itself. Uh, 
and then one and two are attracted to each other. So they are opposite charges. Uh, every charge repels itself, uh, but basically plus and minus are attracted to each other. And this electrostatic looking uh, uh, phase happens to be one which is uh, always stable. And this is the one that I showed you about um, in those studies of the small molecules. So the, the formation of the molecules and so on, all fall in this category. Um, the opposite corner top left is essentially uh, some kind of generalized gravity in which you would have positive and negative masses. So one attracts one and two attracts two, but one and two repel each other as if we had, we could have essentially positive masses and negative masses. Um, in that case, we have uh, this kind of mutual expulsion of the two populations. Uh, the other two corners are non-reciprocal interaction in the very strong sense because we have chasing interactions. So for example, here, one repels one, two attracts two, one is attracted to two, two is repelled by one. Uh, and that means one chases after two and the opposite happens down here. And these are the cases where we see interesting uh, uh, aggregation with a given stoichiometry. For example, in this corner, you can see uh, Brownian dynamic simulation in 3D. Uh, basically, these uh, macroscopic clusters form with a, the with a given stoichiometry between the blue and red uh, uh, particles, which is decided by the initial values of the concentration and the mobilities. Um, and we check that the stoichiometry is essentially in agreement with the uh, linear stability analysis and that the clusters, when they stop, uh, essentially they are activity the chemical activity of a final cluster is uh, is neutral, which means they uh, don't have a net generation of, um, of chemicals. Uh, in this regime, you can also have transient uh, structures because of secondary instabilities. For example, you can have the situation where the B particles form a layer on the cluster and then they uh, have a surface instability because they repel each other. Uh, and they shed some and then they become asymmetric and they self propelled because of that and then come back to that uh, behavior again. Uh, it could be that this effect uh, is maintained at a, at a much longer time because it couples to the um, expulsion to the bulk and recruitment from the bulk in a more or less stationary state. Uh, so if you think about it, these are all very interesting structures that can exist in, in any enzymatic uh, metabolic network, uh, depending on how they couple to each other uh, in terms of their activity and mobility parameters. Uh, in this corner, um, I mentioned that they basically expel each other or exclude each other. Um, and this is uh, quite efficient um, uh, gravitational collapse with, uh, with neutral expulsion. Uh, if you have two producers, you expect to have homogeneous phase uh, in this uh, top right corner, uh, which is what we see. Uh, complete collapse in this bottom left corner, uh, which is basically uh, what is seen here. Um, and also cases where you see uh, dense dilute coexistence with a depletion layer near the cluster, which comes from the repulsive interaction. And that's also observed. You can uh, trigger interactions by having doping agents to start from stability uh, uh, under one condition and then add something which will make the system go across. So this is a very efficient way if you want to control reaction uh, 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 steps and so on. Uh, you can ask this question for very large systems because the linear stability analysis should still persist. So uh, you can have 20 different species, for example, and still the condition will tell you whether it's uh, going to phase separate into a cluster with a given stoichiometry or not, or remain homogeneous. Uh, 
and also we can have metastable uh, structures. So in, um, uh, yes, in this uh, whole you know movie, uh, the does particle get created or, or you, you don't allow the particle to uh, you know? No, this is all conserved. Yeah, so in all of these um, videos, you have number conservation for anything that you see. I see. And, and the other question I have is the where does the uh, scenario of Turing pattern formation fit in your in this exercise? Turing uh, so formation. You 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 know if you are doing this uh, linear stability analysis, uh, expanding to the you know this uh, Fourier regime, there can be this Fourier mode can be unstable, right? Yeah. So Turing pattern. Uh, uh, happens, it's a bit easier to discuss it with the next section, but in this part, essentially we're dealing with long range interactions. So it's really not in the same class as the one that you, uh, you obtain Turing pattern. Uh, plus for those uh, instabilities, you always need very different diffusivities. Mm -hmm. That's right. But, uh, you know, this was recently, this uh, uh, Goldstein and Haas, uh, uh, they published a paper, if the number of components is very large, then, I mean, following the argument of a robot to May, you can have, uh, always have some very, I don't know, instability is very easy to see. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct, but that's an, that's a, that's a system with no conservation law. So, we, we deal with conserved systems. I mean, what you see here, it, it's all conserved because all of, these oh, yeah, yeah. I see. all of these components, they have, you know, continuity equation equals zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kind of reaction diffusion system where you see uh, Turing pattern, and I think I know this paper by Goldstein uh, and so on, uh, it's, it's about the class of system that you have reaction terms on the right-hand side already in the in the quantities that you're looking at. So here the uh, structure formation is mediated by this long range for ethic interaction. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so then uh, the next class of systems that I want to discuss, uh, essentially a general uh, 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 framework for studying non-reciprocal interaction in scalar active matter uh, is when we have short-range interactions. And short-range interactions can come from uh, chemical interactions and phoresis and so on. If you screen it, uh, for example, uh, using the right uh, chemical uh, uh, conditions. For example, I mentioned michaelis menten rule. If you have catalytic rates that are diffusion limited that can lead to a screening of the of the interaction um, uh, or you can have other types of interaction that lead to uh, non reciprocal uh, interaction that are short range and uh, I want to ask this question generically suppose I have a system which is um, which is scalar and it, it represents phase separation so con Hilliard model and I introduce uh, this notion of non-reciprocal interaction in that. What happens uh, basically when you add a non-reciprocal uh, element to the con Hilliard model? Uh, so again, polarity uh, orientation and so on is not here the slow variable. Um, we assume that only density uh, is the slow variable. So typically, uh, you build a con Hilliard model by having um, essentially continuity equation for a number of components. So uh, let's say phi i uh, represents the scalar field and then you write down continuity equation where the flux comes from the gradient of the chemical potential that you write for that system at equilibrium uh, deriving from a free energy uh, which has the right minima. So this is a Ginsburg-Landau or uh, or uh, Flory Huggins type free energy. Uh, essentially, you have a polynomial in the uh, fields um, and you have gradient terms to make sure that the interfaces um, are, are smooth. Um, and then you can add a noise to that to basically study the uh, 
uh, dynamics uh, uh, es essentially within the number conservation, uh, also including noise. Now, um, it's uh, quite clear if you if you look at the equations that it is impossible to uh, inflict non-reciprocal uh, nature on the dynamics if you essentially try to modify the free energy. So whatever you do to the free energy uh, in terms of interaction between species I and J always ends up being reciprocal uh, when you uh, basically boil it down to the level of the equation of motion. And in order to break this uh, structure, uh, you have to break the equilibrium structure, which means uh, you need to add this non-reciprocal term after you calculate the equation of motion. So to the chemical potential directly, rather than the free energy that you use to derive the chemical potential. And the component that will uh, introduce the non-reciprocal uh, aspect will be basically represented with an anti-symmetric matrix because the symmetric part is already taken into account. So then our new con uh, system will basically have a flux, which is the gradient of a non-equilibrium chemical potential, which has this uh, anti-symmetric uh, matrix uh, uh, coupling to the concentration field plus noise. And the question is, what happens when you basically add that? Um, it's easier to, to look at two components because basically um, all the physics should be already there. So let's say we have two species, a binary mixture, and we add uh, essentially an anti-symmetric matrix in 2D has only one independent component, which we call alpha. Um, so then the non-equilibrium chemical potentials get these additional corrections uh, to the other concentration field. And then we have a situation where the uh, chi parameter, the Flory Huggins term, com competes with this non reciprocal term. And um, essentially, depending on the signs, we again have the same classification. We have uh, mutual repulsion if alpha is less than one, uh, than chi, but the strength of the repulsion is, is non reciprocal. If alpha is more than chi, we have a change in the sense of interaction. So, uh, two will chase after one, and uh, the other way around when chi is, is negative. So it turns out that when you uh, study the dynamics of this binary mixture, when alpha is less than chi, essentially the system still behaves like an equilibrium uh, kahn hilliard model, only you will have uh, uh, some uh, sort of uh, modifications in the in the way things uh, happen. So, for example, you would still have macroscopic phase separation uh, uh, in the phase diagram of the two phases. Uh, you would still have uh, this uh, construction of the binodal and the uh, spinodal and and the two critical points, uh, and uh, also ripening, uh, which is basically the growth of the domains. Uh, as a function of time with this exponent one third. Uh, but then something happens um, as you go to higher activity coefficients. For example, the uh, region starts to shrink uh, uh, the binodal uh, uh, region. And uh, essentially, at some point, they detach and uh, two new critical points emerge from the center uh, of this domain. So then we will have two different distinct or disconnected regions representing uh, phase separation. Uh, these uh, yellow shaded domains in the phase diagram essentially are regions where we have um, the complex uh, uh, eigenvalues uh, in the relaxation, which means when the system relaxes, uh, you also have some oscillations. But the oscillations are essentially a short time uh, scale feature, so they don't feature in the phase behavior of the system. Here you can see a, a video of the coarsening process. Basically, it's similar to any uh, equilibrium coarsening uh, process that you will have seen. Uh, and that's essentially the case uh, when alpha is uh, smaller than chi. Uh, when alpha uh, becomes bigger than chi, the situation changes uh, 
uh, quite drastically because essentially there will be a new uh, instability which kicks in in this region where you have imaginary eigenvalues, so in the yellow region, and also the uh, topology already changes. You have these four different uh, regimes for the uh, or domains for the for the binodal uh, uh, and spinodal, so for the phase separating uh, parts. And in this uh, region, we see self-propelled pat patterns. So, um, uh, for example, if you zoom a little bit more in that very uh, sort of inner region, we see an active smectic phase in which um, uh, essentially you, you get these layers uh, that form. So they select the wavelength and they also select a polarity. They choose a direction and they start to move or propel in that direction. And there's also defect coarsening uh, and that can be observed. Um, and then uh, outside of that region in another uh, uh, circle, you see uh, a lattice that forms. Uh, so this is a 1D uh, uh, structure, periodic structure. This is a 2D periodic structure that forms. And then it also, uh, so it selects two length scales and it selects a polarity and, and essentially it starts to propel in that direction. So you're seeing videos here of this uh, active smectic phase, which uh, occurs via defect coarsening. And then you can see uh, the 2D lattice that forms and also moves in some direction. Uh, you can study the coarsening, uh, uh, for example, uh, here you can see how the defects uh, form for this lamellar structure um, and in the end they merge and uh, disappear and you have a, a single domain. Uh, because of that, the exponent uh, changes. Uh, for example, here you can see that it's more like 22, 0.22. Um, and also you can uh, calculate the polar order parameter, a global polar order parameter for the system, which basically uh, picks up uh, when um, alpha, the non-reciprocal term, is stronger than the reciprocal one. Um, the system genuinely uh, develops a true polar uh, order. Um, it is interesting if you think about it, this is a scalar system. Uh, and the only thing that we did to it was introduce non-reciprocal interaction between the elements. Uh, so it's a binary mixture and it's a scalar system. And the system decided itself to spontaneously break time reversal symmetry um, and also global uh, polar uh, order appeared uh, in, a, in a spontaneous way. And this is very interesting because uh, spontaneous uh, appearance of, of a vector uh, uh, type order in a system which is a scalar uh, system is uh, something that you don't anticipate. So when you when you think about pattern formation, uh, you you normally anticipate what kind of or or even phase transition Landau theory. You normally anticipate what kind of symmetry breaking you uh, might have, and you build the symmetry inside the theory, and then you study its. Uh, uh, spontaneous breaking, but here uh, the symmetry is not even uh, there in the in the first place, and it appears um, as an emergent feature. Uh, you can study the transition point, and it turns out that uh, it is a so-called exceptional point because uh, you can write down the linearized uh, theory uh, as essentially a, a non-Hermitian um, uh, evolution, and then show that at this point when alpha is equal to chi or, or in general when there are these uh, concentrations when alpha is equal to this alpha star uh, you have an exceptional point in the sense that the eigenvalues um, uh, collapse uh, and uh, eigenvectors become parallel to each other uh, and then you make a transition into these oscillatory uh, phases where you basically see self propulsion and, and things like that. Uh, so it's it's interesting uh, uh, that you can have this kind of uh, uh, symmetry breaking in, in a system, as I said, which is uh, 
relatively simple by construction. We have this uh, uh, scalar feature. If you add more um, structure to it, you will get other things. For example, this video is from a system um, where you have uh, also some transverse uh, structure that forms. Um, and you basically pick up uh, these two length scales and, and two types of, uh, of motion. Okay, so um, how am I doing with time? Should I basically... Um, how much time do you need for finishing your talk? Uh, so I have two more components. Uh, I can maybe briefly talk about one of them. So one of them is uh, this cooperativity enhanced reactivity, I think it's a relatively uh, sort of simple diversion, uh, which might not be very interesting. Uh, and then I have this coarse graining part, which uh, talks about uh, basically homeostasis in, in, a, in a system with chemical activity, which uh, involves uh, using field theories and so on. So there are a lot of questions during your talk. Maybe you can continue another 10 minutes. After then, maybe just to, we can have discussion session about 10 minutes. OK, uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll, talk about, um, I'll talk about this part then for 10 minutes. Uh, essentially, um, if you think about so going back to the origin of life question, uh, what we have in living systems uh, uh, is a remarkable uh, problem in matching hierarchies because we have uh, uh, cellular structures that form out of molecular ingredients and uh, yet they all come together and give us a whole organism which uh, has very, very uh, high degree of precision in terms of whatever it does. So the so-called homeostasis, uh, which means if conditions change a little bit, they can adopt things so that essentially the, uh, the system is stable again, up to some uh, threshold. And all of that comes from individual units that uh, perform away from equilibrium. So for example, you can abstract a, a unit cell as a, a system where you have chemical and mechanical non-equilibrium activity controlled by information and then interacting with the environment. And then uh, via essentially passing on that uh, to the neighboring cells, uh, through the environment, you um, achieve a system at a large scale, which is stable. And this is a very uh, interesting question. You know, how do you bridge the length scales from a single molecule and the activity all the way to the level of the organism and maintain or, or ensure that the system will remain uh, uh, stability? Uh, Chemical activity, again, uh, I think will uh, be a major uh, ingredient in that. And uh, together with other uh, features, for example, number fluctuations, uh, uh, division and, and death uh, processes, uh, noise, diffusion, and so on, um, it will be uh, possible to build uh, simple theories. Um, and uh, one feature that is uh, interesting from the point of view of statistical physics is if you build these uh, into uh, ingredients into field theories, uh, you will obtain nonlinearities in your field theories that have the same strength. So, for example, here you will see um, an example of a, a system where you have uh, chemotactic interaction, uh, the scalar one essentially a drift in the form of uh, density times gradient of a concentration, which is itself produced by essentially a diffusion equation uh, in which the density is the source. Um, so that's uh, basically a nonlinearity, which has, if you count the number of uh, del operators, essentially uh, Laplacian or, or uh, gradient to the power zero uh, and two powers of the density. And then if you uh, look at growth, uh, you also have a density to the power two at the lowest order as your nonlinearity. Uh, so you have two terms representing collective chemotaxis or chemical signaling and growth or cell division, which can compete with each other uh, in the RG sense, in the sense of renormalization group or strength of nonlinearities. 
Uh, yet this one is conserved and this one is not. So they have different kinds of uh, symmetries. Uh, and this is a very interesting feature because it, it allows for these um, nonlinear mechanisms to compete with each other and uh, under some conditions to create uh, stability and, and homeostasis. So if you do this calculation for this simple model, for example, in the uh, space of these nonlinearities, you can find uh, flows. This one is growth. This one is the chemical signaling that uh, there is a relative uh, sort of uh, region at some length scales at which you would basically achieve stability and then there's a threshold beyond which uh, you lose this uh, uh, competition which leads to control between the growth and the chemotaxis mechanism and they are associated with uh, super diffusion and hyper uniformity when it comes to the exponents uh, in terms of number fluctuation and mean square displacement which i think are both very useful traits uh, for, for living systems. Um, so essentially, uh, in the dynamical systems language, uh, you know, if you want to understand uh, how matter comes alive, uh, we need to understand how in this very large space of parameters, uh, non-equilibrium activity can lead to situations when you would basically generate uh, stability or homeostasis in, in this uh, sense of the dynamical system with a few uh, small number of essentially tuning parameters. Uh, and uh, I would finish by just uh, highlighting this other work that we did recently uh, where we looked at uh, so this course training uh, program where we looked at the competition between uh, two different uh, 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 types of uh, response to a chemical gradient. One, the usual uh, scalar response, which you can call the Keller-Siegel uh, model, and one which is essentially a polarity-driven uh, uh, response. So uh, it's a, it, it's in the uh, um, uh, analogy to let's say a dipole component of the electrostatic uh, uh, interaction. Uh, which knows about the orientation and the higher order of the uh, of the chemical field. And then it turns out when you build this into the uh, the model, uh, uh, it turns out that this polarity basically uh, will generate, so I'll, I'll flash a few uh, equations, in, including moment expansion and coarse graining. Uh, when you go into the level of uh, the um, uh, coarse grained equation at the largest scale. I'll just find the right equation, uh, maybe this one. Uh, you will have um, another term, a new term in chemotaxis, uh, which will have again the same power counting as the Keller Siegel and the growth term that I showed you before, uh, but this time also another type of symmetry. Uh, uh, so in, in reality, we have uh, three different terms or access to three different terms that have the same power counting uh, strength with different kinds of uh, symmetry. And we find in this paper, um, essentially, uh, uh, some equilibrium structure for the Keller-Siegel model uh, uh, and argue that this additional term is not equilibrium and uh, is essentially belongs to a different uh, class if you want. And uh, together, uh, they also uh, conspire to uh, adopt a, a, a sort of emergent symmetry, which is similar to the Galilean uh, symmetry that we have in KPZ equation. Uh, and that puts a constraint on the exponents and allows us to calculate exponents uh, exactly, which is very interesting for the system. Uh, and again, the, the exponents tell us the same thing, which is hyper uniformity for number fluctuations and super diffusion for the, uh, uh, for the, for the motion um, of, of individual cells, which are both very useful uh, traits. I think with this, I can probably wrap things up and uh, maybe um, uh, take questions. Thanks, Lamin. Uh, now we can have a discussion session so any audience can have a comment or a question, anything you, you can.
Yes, so maybe I can stop sharing uh, so that I can see you. Uh, is it okay for me to ask? Sure. Yes, go ahead. So I, th yeah, thank you for a very nice talk. So I, um, I think I got a little bit confused about the the continuum model that you showed in the non-reciprocally interacting system versus the um, like the particle basis simulation that you did. Is there any like correspondence? I mean, because it, it sh there should be, right? I mean, is do you see the the traveling wave pattern formation forming? Um, yes. So if you're asking about the non-reciprocal con Hilliard model versus the one that comes from the sort of chemical interaction, yeah, the, the correspondence uh, comes from uh, essentially the range of interactions. So both correspond to, let's say, if you take a binary system, uh, you can have a situation where interaction between A and B is non-reciprocal, but non-reciprocal with a finite range versus non-reciprocal with a Coulomb structure. Uh, so if you think about this in equilibrium, these two situations are different universality classes also. You can have a colloidal suspension, which is driven by uh, excluded volume effect interaction and uh, van der Waals interaction and this kind of other short range interaction, or you can have an ionic liquid or an ionic uh, colloidal um, uh, system in which you have a uh, long-range Coulomb interaction. But isn't um, that, like, if you have a dense enough fluid, don't, don't you get a screening effect such that um, you'll get effectively short-ranged? Um, so in, that's exactly the correspondence. So in, in equilibrium systems, you will always have screening, uh, in, which means you can make a transition from one to the other. Uh, in the non-equilibrium system, it's not given that you will always have screening. The screening comes from the scheme of reaction that you have. So if you have a uh, first order reaction, uh, then your substrate essentially uh, is, uh, is screened. Uh, if you have, on the other hand, uh, reaction dominated or, uh, you know, uh, saturated, uh, michaelis menten type reaction, then your uh, substrate is not screened and the, the interaction between particles is truly long range. And in that case, you will have essentially a different class uh, because and, of- And the latter is the one that corresponds to your particle-based simulation? Yes, we basically had screening, but the screening length was large enough uh, that we would see in the box as effectively long range interaction. And we have covered the, the full range of crossovers. So we know how the crossover changes uh, from one to the other. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the situation is um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if, if, if you have, um, Coulomb-like systems with screening, then you can have uh, a, a domain inside which you have these long-range effects, and then outside of that, you will expect to cross over to the short-range one. I see. I see. Thanks. And another short question. So, uh, me and Vincenzo and Michelle and Peter have a paper on non-reciprocal interacting system, and it's um, it's about I think it, that corresponds to model N and your colleague um uh, your continuum model corresponds to the model B. And my question is like, we also examined the critical fluctuations around that exceptional point. And if you find something anomalous, like we have like um, anomalously large fluctuation that um, shows up in like the lower critical dimension goes, at least in the Gaussian level goes up to four and the upper critical dimension went all the way up to eight. Um, and I'm not sure. So of course the, you know, the model A and model B would have different universality class, but did, have you examined like what the fluctuation does near this critical point? Um, uh, yes, I mean, we haven't, we haven't published those, but uh, naturally just looking at the, uh, 
I mean, the, the, the first thing we, we, we did was to focus on the symmetry breaking aspect because uh, already, uh, as I said, for me, seeing uh, emergence of polar symmetry in a scalar system was very, very shocking. Uh, I didn't expect that uh, to, to happen. Normally, when you have pattern forming system, you put that by hand somehow. You say, I have this maybe cross Hohenberg construction where I have a Laplacian and then I have a, a fourth derivative term or something. And then I, I sneak in a length scale uh, or, or an instability by changing the sign of something. Yeah. Here, we didn't do anything like that. We just broke the correspondence between action and reaction. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things, also because of the, uh, the way we, we motivated non-reciprocal interaction through catalytic system, it's very, very natural that you will always have this kind of thing in, in non-equilibrium systems. Uh, so, uh, my guess is that uh, if we dig deeper, this would be basically the, you know, it could lead to a lot of interesting consequences, which uh, for which maybe people have invented very complex uh, things to, uh, to explain. But, you know, just having this one very natural ingredient will, will be an alternative, uh, which is very attractive. Thanks. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh, so in in your uh, you know presentation, you shows uh, show the some um, I mean you you made argument or I mean picture and the movie they are all uh, I mean pattern uh, giving rise to a pattern which is a stable pattern or some periodic uh, you know dynamics time in time and space, and then I was wondering. What's your opinion of the chaotic dynamics? I mean, which you haven't actually dealt to it. Yes. Uh, so you you will have um, um, yeah. I mean, essentially, this question um, can be rephrased differently. So you. When you when you build a model, you decide on terms. You know, with this kind of Ginsburg-Landau, it's always the same. Or 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 uh, uh, Flory Huggins and or or Khan Hilliard. You you basically uh, uh, decide what elements to keep and what elements not to keep. Uh, what we did was essentially the simplest way that you can change this model. If you want, we just made the temperature term in in the Ginsburg-Landau equation, non-reciprocal. That's the most basic term that you can play with. Is, no, no, is no. The, my, my, point is that, uh, my, my point is that in real life or real nature, we see this uh, chaotic dynamics all, all over the place. For instance, like a uh, failure of a heart and kidney and diabetes, or these uh, are the consequences of chaotic dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so in order to avoid those chaotic dynamics, we need to understand uh, what actually causing this chaos and things like that. So, so yes, I, I, <laughs> I agree mean, with that. We don't have think... a homeostasis, but uh, also we have we have to. This is like a pathological dynamics we have to worry about. You know? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, my my suggestion will be that those will come from nonlinear terms, and when you when you know what they are, or when you add them and you observe that they they lead to this kind of uh, spatiotemporal chaos, then you know what controls them. And for example, we know in, in active turbulence, we know in uh, uh, active pneumatics and so on, uh, dry and wet, uh, what leads to this kind of uh, instability and, and chaotic behavior. Uh, and in this kind of model, it's also possible to get that kind of behavior. Uh, and basically, uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, the, the way we did it was uh, through the simplest possible generalization, but then the other terms will also uh, have the same kind of structure. And if you, if you change those, you will get uh, chaos. Okay, we're gonna have a last question. Looks like a, a Dr. Lowe has a question, am I wrong? Yes, uh, can you hear? 
Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, I also have a question regarding your non-reciprocal system. So uh, along with, alongside with the question of Changbong, I was also wondering about the dynamic patterns happening in the system. So if you have a look at the um, phi one and phi two diagram that you draw at once uh, mm -hmm. as some slide, it seems like the, despite the patterns are moving across the space, uh, when you have a look at, when you follow the, each cluster and then have a look at the composition of phi one and phi two, this seems to be sustaining certain fraction. Therefore, in that sense, uh, the system seems to be falling into the attractor in the phi one and phi two diagram. Mm -hmm. And since you are in the uh, system, which is not respecting the tiny versus symmetry, another possibility would be having a limit cycle in phi one and phi two diagram. Or if there are three species, we might even have chaos. So have you ever seen such kind of limit cycle in the composition? Yes, yes. Uh, so in fact, um... I think I forgot to, to mention this. Uh, these uh, diagrams, let me go back to this. So what you see here, uh, do you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, so what you see here is the uh, 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 dynamic uh, portrait of phi one and phi two space. So when you're inside here, you see the limit cycles, uh, these little ones, little diagrams. Uh, uh, and then okay. When you are here, you see filled diagrams, which means they essentially spiral into the, the fixed point, which is at the uh, at the center or, or somewhere, uh, essentially controlling the uh, the different densities. So, in fact, um, in the paper, if you look at it, uh, there are blown up versions of these diagrams, and uh, in in all of these oscillatory, so in active smectic and two D lattice the phases, we see uh, limit cycles basically. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lamin. It's timed up. Uh... Thank you for your nice talk, actually. So uh, I, had, uh, I have uh, some announcements for next talk, actually. Uh, coming Thursday, uh, 10 a.m. in Korean time, we have a talk by Irene Chen from UCLA. She is going to talk about emergent byproduct of evolution. So we'll see Thursday. Thanks very much. Everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I mean. <laughs>